my name is Josh Mills, and I work for Washington State Department of Agriculture in the uh, Plant Protection uh, Department studying biology and ecology of the apple maggot. I was actually recently made the uh, spotted lanternfly coordinator for the state. Not entirely sure if that was a, a, a bonus or was that just to, uh, um, you know, make it go crazy. But hey, either way, I love insects, so this, this is a bonus for me. So basically, I wanted to talk about um, lanternflies. Um, and so, you know, what is a spotted lanternfly? That's the real question, isn't it? Well, uh, lanternfly, Lacoma delicatula, is a plant hopper in the family Fogoridae. There's actually about 129 genera with about 696 species in the world. Um, actually, nine genera and 17 species are present in North America. And worldwide, Lacoma is actually represented by seven species. Actually, most, uh, I should say like most plant hoppers, they use their proboscis uh, to feed on sap. Um, basically think about it like a straw that they use to feed on uh, the actual host plants. This is done by what, what is coined typically as piercing and sucking. It's, it's an F effect where the uh, feed on carbohydrates found in the phloem, uh, phloem sap that is, which are nutrient rich compounds that, um, that are contained inside of that sap, where, um, where many other plant products usually lacking actual toxins. So this is actually a benefit for the insect, not so much for the growers. So basically, uh, spotted lanternfly has a body size of about an inch. Um, as you can see in this um, photo, the proboscis in this is about a quarter of an inch long. Inside, there are these straw-like mouth parts. Um, there, there are actually two tiny hair-like stylets that are just like thin little hairs, um, that, about the size of a human hair, actually. Uh, they get inserted into the plant's tissue. And this is where the spotted lanternfly uses to salivate and actually probe and puncture plant tissues. Again, uh, lanternfly is a generalist feeder. It can feed on pretty much anything. They're easily adaptable to their surroundings. In fact, actually there's over 172 host plants. Now we'll get a little bit onto that a little later in this lecture, but uh, all you need to know is that this is a problem and a major problem. So basically, um, I'd like to uh, quickly go over a little bit of the background of the insect and its biology, um, starting with the life cycle. So typically, the uh, spotted lanternfly egg hatches in around May through June. Starting in June through July, the first instars will molt, becoming the second instar. Uh, molting will happen again in mid-June through mid-July to give the third instar. Then July through September, you can get the fourth instars. Um, at the fourth instar stage, you begin to start seeing some of the distinctive red coloring on their mark, uh, markings on their body. Wing pads start to um, be more pronounced. Uh, the, my colleagues over on the East Coast have actually mentioned that this is about the same time that they start seeing a significant uptick in calls from residents reporting that they've actually witnessed spotted lanternfly on their uh, property. Uh, starting in late July through December, adults are present and do not overwinter. Um, again, as the temperatures start dropping to freezing levels, adult, adults will die off. However, the eggs uh, live on. Egg laying occurs from October through November, and then those eggs are found, uh, are found October through June in the following year, when they begin to hatch and the life cycle continues all over again. So this is a, a bit of a uh, dilemma for the uh, community. Um, also really lucky for the insect. Um, it's able to adapt so effectively. So we have to talk a little bit about how um, spotted lanternfly feeds. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about its life cycle, uh, but where is spotted lanternfly originally from? Well, uh, spotted lanternfly is native to Asia and it's actually found all over China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. It was actually introduced in Japan, South Korea, and recently in 2014 in the state of Pennsylvania and Burnt County. Uh, these images here um, indicate a really cool graphical map of the uh, species, they're able to um, jump uh, three to four uh, or move three to four miles by walking, jumping, and flying. So they're actually pretty um, impressive. So here, like I mentioned, here's the uh, map. You can see where they're located uh, in, in Japan, South Korea. It quickly actually got out of hand and spread all over the um, country in a matter of just three short years over there. Uh, they consider it an invasive species, which has been reported to be negatively impacting grapes and peaches over there. 
Um, however, in Pennsylvania, the story has been significantly different thanks to those who are working hard to control this invasive species. Uh, with that said, I should say lanternfly has also been detected in 14 Eastern states, Connecticut, uh, Delaware, Massachusetts, Maryland, Oh gosh, let's see here. I think North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, Rhode Island, Indiana. And of course, I should also mention the uh, most recent introduction in uh, Michigan, Michigan State, that is. So this is actually um, something that kind of keeps me up at night um, when it comes down to an invasive species. This is considered one of the worst ones we're going to see in uh, many long years to come. Uh, it's not a question of is it coming, but when is it coming? And that's actually why um, I'm taking a very aggressive approach with this insect. I'd like to point out that in Washington, it's not here. Um, however, that doesn't mean we should be just relaxing. We should actually be uh, proactive. So again, I wanted to show a spread of spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania. You know, this is uh, uh, um, live data as, um, as the uh, spread continues. This data is actually, up, this map is, uh, is updated. So uh, it's, it doesn't bite or sting, I should say. However, um, it can kill trees and it feeds on, by feeding on them. Um, spotted lanternflies is a plant stressor that along with other stressors can cause significant damage to its hosts. So the economic uh, concern to the industry, especially here in Washington state, you can look here in this uh, paper that was published uh, back in 2020 by uh, Dr. Wakey and uh, my colleagues down in um, Yakima County um, with USDA. Um, so basically, you know, we're looking at a $10 billion value um, um, commodities, multiple commodities. Um, we're talking, you know, apples, hops, cherries, grapes, and pears, uh, totaling for Washington, Oregon, and California. These are prime real estate when you think about it for the uh, lanternfly. Specifically, if you look at the um, Yakima, Benton, and Walla Walla region, all of that red highlighted region is actually prime real estate for the uh, lanternfly. And guess what? That's where all of our major industry is located, especially when it comes down to agriculture. There's a lot of uh, apples in the Yakima County. In fact, actually it's the uh, largest apple producing county in uh, all of North America. Like I said, a spotted lanternfly is a generalist and has over 172 host plants it can feed on, with a tree of heaven being one of the uh, reproductive hosts of this pest. So this is basically um, why we're very concerned, um, um, in, especially in Washington, uh, because in addition to um, apples, grape damage is a priority for this pest. It also poses a risk to orchards, uh, hardwoods and uh, nursery industries, as we had mentioned earlier, all of these industries are major contributors to our economy. And so spotted lanternfly poses a significant economic risk to the lot of what we have here in our valley. In Pennsylvania, spotted lanternfly populations have detected or have been detected and managed in grapes and the damage is significant. Whereas spotted lanternfly feeding on grapes, they excrete their waste. That waste is called honeydew. Honeydew is actually a very uh, sugary substance that they feed on and excrete and lands on the grapes and leaves. And you can see that it is clearly in this picture. This leaf is actually covered with honeydew because of the sugar um, on it. And eventually it promotes uh, black mold. This can ca uh, cause uh, leads to a mold problem throughout the vineyard. Sadly, you can only apply certain chemistries so late into the season. And as the adults are feeding late in the uh, year, this is where it poses a major economic risk to the grape industry. And we cannot afford that here in our valley, especially in, in both on the uh, west and east side of the, uh, the Cascade Mountain Range. Uh, so I basically wanted to show um, the, uh, you know, what, what Washington State Department of Agriculture has been doing. You know, we've actually been conducting surveys across um, the uh, state since 2018, all the way through 2020. So we've been proactive with this, um, this pest. And that's one of the things why we make this such a, um, a priority amongst our program is we want to do everything we can to intercept it, if it or I should say when it comes. Um, so we, we are trying to be prepared um, with that said. Um, I actually last year started a, a program where we actually have been uh, gathering data um, of tree of heaven, Lacoma delicatula. This is actually an invasive species in Washington state. Um, it's a class C noxious weed. However, 
it's actually um, all over the uh, area. And with that said, it is actually the reproductive host of the lanternfly. Wow. So one of the concerns that we're trying to do is, you know, map out these tree of heaven so that we can actually target the tree at uh, ports of entry. That is actually a priority right now with our program because it's something we can actually work on be, uh, before the uh, lanternfly gets to uh, the state. I'd like to point out in, in um, Oregon State back in 2020, they intercepted and eradicated uh, two individuals that were detected there. Um, in Oregon, they had a couple of um, uh, introductions. Fortunately, all of these, and I want to underline all of them, uh, were taken care of, and there is no establishment on the West Coast. However, like I said earlier, it's only a matter of time. Um, there's the, the issue of uh, um, hitchhiking is significant. Uh, Josh, you have about four minutes left. Okay, thank you so much. Of course. So I just wanted to point out that, you know, Hitchhiking is a, a major uh, mode of transportation for this pest. We've, got, we've uh, of course, because of the egg masses, they're able to lay on the surface of any substrate. They like to lay on um, uh, surfaces like this rock. My boss, Sven Spanger, is actually pointing at an egg mass. The egg mass is covered by a spongy material that acts as a waterproof sealant. And, and, over, uh, and, and uh, this material is able to uh, protect the, the uh, insects' eggs from uh, cold, and on water, and water, so the elements essentially, and can be on, like I said, on any surface, which terrifies me because here we, we can have them on multiple different surfaces. Um, I, in fact, I had a colleague tell me that he was driving 60 miles per hour in New Jersey when he saw a lanternfly hanging desperately on his uh, windshield, windshield wiper. Uh, he pulled over, and uh, sure enough, there was a, a, a mated female. She had egg, egg masses, so he squashed her. But this is how lanternfly is going to be spreading around. It's through hitchhiking. So imagine a, um, a family moving from Pennsylvania and actually bring, bringing their family and all of their, uh, you know, kitty toys with them. It's very easy to think that, yes, this is how they can spread. And look at all these egg masses covering all of these uh, um, items. So this is, this is a real problem. And that's why we're, uh, we're here. So with that, I wanted to point out, this is the type of damage we're dealing with. Um, the huge volumes over on the uh, East Coast. This is what it looks like. However, I'm doing everything I can along with uh, my colleagues um, with the uh, um, uh, Washington Invasive Species Council. We're trying to uh, prevent this from happening in our community. And that's why it's important that everyone here who's listening to this uh, uh, webinar uh, be aware of this pest. You know, this, this, is, this is what we're gonna be dealing with if we uh, allow this pest to come into our state. So, Again, I just wanted to show you the uh, why should we care? You know, hitchhiking is, uh, you know, it may have happened over on the East Coast, but is it likely to come over here? Well, like I said, it's easy to move over here. Here's my little animation showing just how easy it would be to come on a railroad. Whoop, uh-oh. So now we have lanternfly in our state. So this is one of the many examples, and I think one of the most likely examples how it will be introduced. It just takes a, a couple of egg masses to cause chaos. So with that, I do want to say thank you so much. Uh, if you want to uh, contact us, we have three modes of uh, connection. Please uh, email pestprogram at agr.wa.gov. Uh, you can also use the Washington Invasive Species app. Um, that's free online for both uh, iPhone and uh, uh, Android users. But you can also call this number here. Um, thank you so much for your time. and then Here's my contact in case anyone wants to chat with me directly about uh, Lanternfly. I would be more than happy to give you more information and give you other great websites to uh, you know, help educate the uh, community. With that, thank you for having me.
be submitted to a diagnostic lab. And there's a rapid, if you will, ELISA, that only takes a, a day or two to do. Um, it's not like an animal side test. Or the, the, the animal, um, the, the tissues are looked at under the microscope um, using a special stain to, to see the, the accumulation of prions. We really can't reliably diagnose the disease in live animals. We need the head of the animal uh, after death to make the diagnosis for sure. Two minutes. Okay. So again, some final take-home messages. I would argue this is the most important disease in wildlife. Uh, it's a unique class of disease with being a prion disease. And these environments are uh, contaminated for a long time once they, they become infection, in, in, uh, contaminated. Um, we really need to be doing surveillance, particularly in areas where the disease hasn't been identified yet. Um, if you ever have an a animal that you think might have chronic wasting disease, the best thing is to take the head. There's a portion of the brain and a retropharyngeal lymph node, it's called, that can be submitted for testing. Remember, don't shoot the animal in the head if it's a CWD suspect, because we want that brain tissue intact. Um, it, the disease is not known to uh, be transmitted to humans, but CDC um, recommends that these animals, if they're CWD suspects, not be consumed by humans. And if you'd like to know more, there's lots and lots of literature out there on CWD now, but uh, Escobar has a nice um, review paper. So if you have additional questions uh, for, about surveillance or about submitting samples, please let me know, and I'm always happy to, um, to talk more.